So I would like to welcome all of you to the next edition of the Slack Public Lectures. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we are looking forward to having these lectures back in the Panofsky Auditorium at the Slack site, but um, please excuse me, uh, the pandemic is what it is, so we're still remote. And uh, we thank you very much for taking time out of your busy home schedule to be here. Uh, the lecture today is going to be very interesting. It's uh, about how to leave transistors in the dust and a vision for uh, new ways to do uh, functional computing. Uh, the lecturer is Aaron Lindenberg, who is a professor both on campus in the Department of Material Science and Engineering and a professor at Slack in our Department of Photon Science. Um, Aaron is a, a very distinguished person in this field. Um, a long time ago, he made a lot of waves by taking photographs of ultra-fast uh, picosecond motion of individual atoms in various materials. Um, he got his PhD from Berkeley on the basis of that work. He was brief briefly a faculty member at Berkeley, but then he came over to our side of the bay and here he's been making waves also in uh, trying to understand the details of various exotic materials, some of which he'll tell you about today. Um, he uh, is, has a Department of Energy Outstanding Mentor Award and uh, has a very active group here at Slack and using our facilities. Um, at the end of the lecture, there will be a question and answer session. So please, if you'd like to hear a further discussion of any of the points of this lecture, uh, please give us your question. You can ask a question by looking at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a Q&A box. And if you would write that question into the Q&A, we will go through these one after another and ask uh, Aaron and a couple of his colleagues who are here about your questions. But um, right now, let's just uh, get on to the matter at hand. Uh, Aaron, please take it over and tell us about the next, uh, the next stage in building uh, computing apparatus. All right, great. Thank you very much, Michael. It's, it's a real great pleasure to be here today. Um, uh, uh, so I wanna tell you about um, a journey that, we, that I think we've really just begun. Um, in, in many ways, I feel like we've just scratched the surface of this work. And, and you know, as, it, as in many good experiments, the, uh, you finish an experiment and oftentimes there are more questions than answers. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll give you my view on, on, um, on um, where we are and, and some, of the, some, some of the, I think, very exciting first work that we've carried out here at Slack. Um, so I'll be talking today about new ways of probing materials and devices as they function, as they operate. Um, and this means looking at the atomic scale and in real time. And, and it turns out that these processes occur on unimaginably short length scales corresponding to the distance between atoms um, and also unimaginably short time scales. Time scales we'll be talking about of the order of picoseconds, which is roughly one thousandth of one billion of a second. So um, these are unimaginably short timescales, and yet it turns out that processes occurring on these types of timescales really determine the functionality and determine how these types of devices work. Um, and I'll be talking in particular today about uh, a really, I think, new class of devices which are really motivated and, and closely connected to the way your brain works. Um, and so we'll be talking about uh, ways of, of, of what, what, what people are now calling brain-inspired computing as a means of, of trying to uh, create devices and materials, which in some way mimic the functionality of the brain. Um, so um, uh, without further ado, we should get started. I want to encourage you, as Michael just said, um, uh, to ask uh, lots of questions. I tried to make this talk as, as general as possible. I'm, hope, I'm hoping there are a bunch of kids out there who are listening. Um, and so no stupid questions. Um, I'm looking forward in particular to the question and answer session at the end of this talk. Okay, so um, to start out with, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and so, so as I mentioned, I hope there are some kids out there. So the first thing I was asking myself when I was trying to make this talk was, well, when, how old was I when I first got interested in science? Um, so on the, on, um, on the, over here on the, on the left, 
um, is a, a picture of me. I think I'm about 12 years old there. Um, and certainly at that time, I, I could say I probably wasn't that interested in science. I, I had sort of the natural curiosity that, that lots of kids have. Um, but certainly I didn't know I wanted to grow up to be a scientist or a professor or anything like that. Uh, but I was interested in, in, I had certain hobbies and one of them was juggling. Um, and I'm bringing that up in particular here because when you think about watching a, an amazing juggler, think about the, the balls moving on an amazingly complex trajectory, um, you know, unbelievably fast. And, you know, what you'd like to do if you want to learn how to juggle that yourself, you'd like to maybe, you know, take some stop action photographs, like to freeze the motion and slow it down so you could st start to learn it yourself. Um, and so the things that I'll be talking about today in many ways are, are kind of built on that idea, except instead of talking about juggling balls moving through space, we're going to be talking about atoms moving on really uh, uh, short length scales and, and really fast time scales. Okay, um, and we're going to try to find ways of really seeing and watch what they do and visualize what they do. Okay, so then I got older and so then um, that's me on the right at Berkeley as a grad student. Um, um, taking some, some uh, experiments where this was one of the early days of, of kind of what, what we call ultra fast x-ray science. Um, and, um, um, uh, and so uh, today I'm gonna kind of t tell you a little bit about where we are. Um, now it's been more than, more than 20 years since then. Um, and, and it's quite amazing to think how far we've, we've come, I think. Um, all right, so um, um, one more sort of uh, just sort of general item of, of kind of motivation um, and also a little bit about myself. Uh, so music is something that's been really important to me for, for a really long time. This is one of my favorite piano pieces. Uh, it's an etude from, from uh, Chopin. Um, and if you haven't heard it, then I definitely encourage you to go out and listen to it. Uh, but, but in part, I'm also mentioning this because when you think about a musical score, of course, there are many notes on this page. Uh, if you think about, first of all, just playing all of the notes at once, well, this certainly wouldn't sound very good. Right, and so the, the part of the the, you know, the, the the some of the central aspects of music involve timing, involve the placement of notes, and and you need to play the notes in the right order with the right dynamic and the right beat, and so on. Um, and so, so this this aspect of of kind of uh, dynamics, um, I think, is is a pro something that is really all around us and and involves many aspects of our lives. Um, so um, um, let me give sort of a, a very kind of brief kind of motivation of, of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, so um, as I mentioned, we'll, we're gonna be talking about new types of electronic devices and switches. Um, and so I think you're prob many of you are probably aware that the computers that you use and the, the phones that you use are all built upon this kind of really magic electronic device called the transistor. Uh, this, was, this was invented first in 1947. Um, and the, you know, the very first uh, transistor looked something like this. Um, uh, it was this giant macroscopic kind of device. Um, at its heart, a, a transistor is an electronic switch. So you think about, a, uh, it's essentially, it's got three inputs or three outputs. Um, and at the bottom here, um, over here, um, this is the, 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 what, at the base, this is the gate. This is like a control, okay? And this control effectively controls the flow of electrons from one side of, of the transistor to the other. And so it's this basic kind of switch, this kind of electronic switch that forms the basis of all the kind of amazing kind of um, processes that, that one can uh, depend upon nowadays uh, within computers. So as I, as I show in the picture there, originally these transistors were really big and, and of course one couldn't imagine um, trying to find ways of, of, um, of packing many of them together, but probably many of you are also familiar with Moore's Law. Um, certainly if, if you're from here, from Silicon Valley, this has played a central role in the, in the development of, of Silicon Valley and so on. And essentially what this says in words is that the density of, of transistors on a chip is doubling something like every couple of years. Um, and so if you think about the sort of exponential growth of, of this process, um, this, what this means in terms of length scales is that people have found ways of shrinking transistors originally from that kind of bulky structure that I showed on the top there, now to something on the size of a DNA strand. So the, the distance, the diameter across from one end of this DNA strand to another is about one nanometer. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. Um, and people have really now found ways of, of, of compressing these transistors and, and uh, growing them now at the 10 nanometer length scale. Um, and so it's this process, it's this kind of doubling, this, this Moore's law that has allowed for, you know, the amazing expansion of computing. And, and nowadays you have millions and millions of transistors in some very small area uh, on a chip. Okay, 
So, um, but nevertheless, it's, it's also clear, and this is becoming more and more clear to, to many people in the field, that there's maybe some end in sight of Moore's law. As you shrink devices beyond the size of, of, of a few nanometers, many complicated effects turn on, quantum mechanical effects uh, occur, and there are many kind of, kind of effects that, that in the end um, seem to imply that maybe we're not gonna be able just to continue shrinking transistors more and more and more. And then on top of that, uh, when you think about computing nowadays, the energy costs associated with computing are really skyrocketing. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some numbers um, in a minute, but nowadays the energy costs just associated with, with, with computing represents large fractions of the, of the total power usage of the world. Uh, and so it's for this reason that many people have, have been excited and started to think about new types of computing where it's not about using a transistor at all. Um, and it's about trying to think about ways of creating devices which are in some, way, in some ways mimic the way the neurons and synapses of your brain actually work. Um, and so this sounds pretty cool. Um, and I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about about how this uh, field has developed, and in particular, some new ways we have of really watching these devices and, and starting to understand how these things actually work um, and the dynamics of them. Um, this, this is you know, really exciting um, from many perspectives. Um, for me, it's exciting. It's a merging of the fields of, uh, it's a merging of many fields in, in science, from computer science to biology, material science, nanoscience, um, and um, you know, really represents kind of a new direction, I think. Um, and the, and the, the key thing, the key or one of the key kind of things that is really required to make these things work, to understand how these things actually function, is you need ways of actually seeing these devices as they function. And as I mentioned, this requires ways of watching these processes occur in real time at the atomic scale. So I was trying to think of, of some way of, of kind of really kind of explaining this in, in, in simple words. Um, and so, so here up, over here, I have a picture of, of someone trying to solve a Rubik's cube. And so everyone knows solving a Rubik's cube is, is a, a really complex endeavor, right? But now what, what about if you tried to solve the Rubik's cube blindfolded? Well, of course you, you probably know people can even do this. Um, this gives you some idea of the power of the human brain and in, in uh, enabling these types of things. But the key point here is that when, you when you're blindfolded, when you can't see these processes as they occur, um, it's much, much more difficult to understand things. And nature is kind of an amazingly complex kind of thing. Um, and, and so the more we can understand and really see how these devices actually have to work, the more we can design better ones, the more we can uh, design new ones with higher efficiency and higher speed and, and so on. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, dynamics is, is really all around us. Um, so I was walking uh, through Stanford campus a couple of months ago. Um, I don't know if you can read the sign on, on your screen, um, but it basically says, this was, this was sort of a motivational uh, sign to motivate the, the football players practicing. You're getting better or you're getting worse. You never stay the same, right? And so this is maybe a, a potentially a good way to live your life or a, mo a motivational kind of way of, of, of improving. But it also gets at this idea that, that really the world is itself just intrinsically dynamic. And, and this is something that I think we're all aware of. Um, there are many examples of this as you start to zoom in in time. Um, and, and so on the left here, I'm showing some fam famous photographs from Harry Edgerton. Um, uh, these, are, these are photos um, using flash photography, uh, you know, in the very early days of, of, of stop action photography. Uh, and so what you can see here, for example, is a picture of a bullet passing through an apple or the very first steps that occur when a hammer strikes a, a glass bottle. Or on the bottom, um, this is, this is uh, uh, someone dropping something into a glass of milk. And so you start to see when you can zoom in in time, when you can start to see these processes that would normally be blurred out to the human eye, that you can start to see this amazing kind of complex processes. Um, and, and by seeing these processes, you can then start to understand them in, in better ways. Um, um, here's one more kind of interesting and cool example that, that I think you might have uh, noticed before if you've ever held an uncooked noodle. Okay, so um, you might have noticed if you ever hold an uncooked noodle, it's this kind of rigid kind of object. When you try to break it, oftentimes the noodle doesn't break in, in just a single spot, as you might sort of naively predict. In fact, it breaks in, in kind of multiple spots. And so what I'm showing here are images of, on millisecond timescales, essentially stop action photographs of the process that occurs when this noodle effectively breaks. 
And you can see it's this amazingly complex process. Um, you can see it breaking in two places, but you can also see waves bouncing back and forth from one end of the noodle to the other. Um, and so this really captures some of the kind of amazing complexity that you start to see when you zoom in in time. Uh, but then on, on top of this, it turns out that, so not only is it powerful to be able to see these things, but when you can zoom in in time, you also oftentimes find ways of engineering these properties. And you oftentimes find ways of, of creating new types of interesting and functional properties. So um, the, this next image here is now a picture where instead of just breaking the noodle, okay, what we do is we just first apply a slight little twist about the long axis of the noodle. Okay, so now there's a slight twist and then you break again. And you can see that when you do this, you completely change the dynamics of, of how this noodle breaks. So this, so that what this illustrates for me at least is, is that as you start to, to zoom in in time on these types of processes, you oftentimes find ways of engineering them and controlling them and creating new types of materials with interesting properties. Okay, so we wanna zoom in um, in space and in time. Uh, and um, so, uh, so what we're talking about here in some sense is a form of microscopy, right? And so here on this slide, this is Gary Larson's take on, on um, the very early microscope, right? Um, so this is, you know, very large scale kind of microscopy. We want to zoom in and now we want to do this at the atomic scale, okay? And at, at, on the scale uh, that, that separates one atom from another in the material. And so can you do this? Um, and so the way I'm going to try to describe to you now how we actually do these types of experiments and how we're able to really measure uh, the structure of a, of a material and watch as it changes. Um, and the key thing that, that the key process that we take advantage of in, in, in um, doing these things is a process uh, that's called, is called diffraction. Okay? And diffraction is really an interference phenomena in, in the end. And this is something that's, that's again, all around us um, and all of us should be familiar with. Um, and so um, what you can see here is um, on, the, on the very far um, left corner of the screen, I'm just showing two pictures of two types of waves um, where um, uh, on the far left, the two, we're adding uh, uh, the orange wave to the green wave. And you can see that the crest of one wave is aligned with the crest of the other wave. And these then add together to form a larger wave with a larger amplitude, right? Whereas if you go over one now, what you can see is that instead, uh, if I just change the relative timing of these two waves, the relative phase of these two waves, and I align them so that the crest of the green wave is aligned with the trough of the, of the top orange wave, then, then in, in that case, these things cancel out. So on the left, this is, called, this is an example of what's called constructive interference. The two waves are adding constructively together. Um, and then on the right, this is an example of destructive interference. And these types of processes are all around us in nature, as I mentioned. Um, uh, there's the example of, of what are oftentimes called rogue waves on the ocean. These are these oftentimes people don't really understand all of the origins of these, uh, but these involve the superposition oftentimes of two waves, which add together to form an extra large wave, which then of course can be um, uh, pretty uh, important if you're sailing out on the ocean and one of those come along. Um, uh, over, um, uh, over here, uh, what we have is a picture of a concert hall. Um, and um, if you've ever been to a concert hall, then, then I think you know that, that you know, the, the sound quality is something that, that is really important. And engineers, when they design a concert hall, they think really carefully about the shape of the room and they think about processes like diffraction and interference. They imagine the sound waves emanating from all the musical instruments down on the stage bouncing off the walls. Uh, and you can imagine this amazingly complex superposition of, of the sound waves all bouncing in many directions and eventually ending up in your ear, right? And so you have to really think about these types of processes in order to, to design an acoustically um, uh, nice uh, uh, musical sound hall. Um, and then um, over here, um, over here, we have um, examples of, of uh, some things that, that, that I really just learned about recently. Um, this is an example of a muffler, which you've probably all seen on cars. Um, and it turns out that mufflers, of course, their, their main design is to reduce the sound that comes out of a car. Um, and they take it, they do this in part by effectively creating the, the you have loud sounds coming from the engines um, and these sound waves bounce off of carefully engineered structures to overall create a destructive interference pattern um, and create uh, such, such that a person standing um, at the back of the car doesn't hear as loud a sound as they normally would. And the same principle um, goes on in noise canceling headphones and so on. Okay, so those are examples about water and sound waves, uh, but the same type of processes also apply to light. 
light is also a wave. Um, and here's a really beautiful example of, of, of diffraction and interference um, applied to this, this amazing butterfly called the giant blue morpho butterfly. Um, uh, if you've ever seen it at the zoo, the, the, you know, the picture of this picture doesn't really capture all the beauty of this, of this, um, of this insect. It's got this amazingly bright blue kind of tinge to it. Um, and so you might think that this is just due to pigments in the, in the skin, in the, in the wings of the butterfly, right? Oftentimes there are materials which will absorb certain colors of light and, and emit certain other, other colors. But in fact, that's not what's happening here in the, in the butterfly. If you zoom in spatially and look at very short length scales, the structure of this wing, then what you see is this kind of these kind of periodic lines uh, oriented like this, and, and these these lines form something called the diffraction grating. Um, and effectively, light waves from the sun, the sun is emitting waves of, of many different colors, the blue waves effectively scatter off of these, these, these uh, uh, micron scale structures in the wing of the butterfly, and they constructively interfere. So the blue part of the spectrum constructively interferes, and the, and the wings look blue, whereas the red part of the spectrum effectively destructively interferes, and so you see dominantly the, the blue part of the, of the scattered light. Um, here's one more sort of just very simple example, same sort of physics, the, a zoom in picture of the surface of the bubble, right? And now you can see the, you've probably all seen these or maybe in, a, in an oil slick after it rains uh, on, on the streets, right? Um, and this kind of these amazing colors are again, all about constructive and destructive interference of various colors coming from, from the light around us. And, and the structure here is reflective of the fact that there are many different large scale variations in the thickness of the very thin walls of the bubble. And as, these, as the thickness of, these, of this bubble changes, uh, it effectively changes which colors destructively or constructively uh, interfere. Okay, so, um, so those are examples just kind of illustrating the process of, of, of um, diffraction interference. But the key point for, the, for this lecture and for this, for this work is that we can actually take advantage of this process and really use interference and diffraction as a ruler to measure distances and measure the spacing between objects. Uh, and so what I'm showing here uh, is an example where you imagine this is just a sort of a, an animated picture. It's not a it's not a not a real photograph, but imagine the surface of a, of a, of a lake and you drop two two rocks into the lake. And uh, probably all of you have noticed the sort of circularly expanding waves that emanate from each point in the lake when you drop that stone. Right. And so what you can see here is that the waves from each of these two um, each of these two sources are interfering with each other and creating this kind of, you know, amazingly complex pattern of, 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 high, of parts where the, where the water waves are high and parts where the water waves are low. Um, and so the key point here about using this as a ruler is that effectively, and I won't take you through the math of, of all of this, but imagine that you could measure this sort of structure, this amazing and sort of image, the structure of all the regions where things are bright and all the regions, places where things are, are dim. You could take this information and effectively work backwards and figure out, learn something about the, the sources that created these waves in the first place. And in fact, you could use this type of, of measurement to really extract the distance between these two sources and, and many more things like this. So this is the essence of, of how we're doing diffraction uh, in, in materials to try to measure the separation between atoms. The only difference is now, now we have to zoom in in wavelength. So we can't use light uh, which has wavelengths on the you know, vi visible light uh, somewhere right around here in, in, in the spectrum has uh, wavelengths of the order of hundreds of nanometers to a micron, right? So a micron, uh, well, you know, the, the width of a human hair is something like 10 or 100 microns. So already, you know, one micron or hundreds of nanometers is a really short length scale. Uh, but in fact, this is still much, much larger than the spacing between atoms. So we actually have to move way, way down the, this curve toward high frequencies, toward the X-ray range in many cases. And it's down here where we're talking about wavelengths on the order of, of you can see 10 to the minus 10 meters, okay? This is oftentimes called one angstrom. Um, it's, a, it's one tenth of a billionth of a meter, you know, a really unimaginably short distance, but nevertheless, it's these types of length scales that we need to um, um, uh, 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 probe if we want to actually uh, really watch materials and understand how they're operating. And 
And actually later, I won't even just be talking about light in terms of doing these measurements. We'll also be talking about electrons. Turns out you can also use electrons to do the same types of diffraction. Um, I won't explain how we do that uh, right now, but that's a, that would be a good thing to ask in the question and answer session if you have thoughts about this. Okay, so um, so how do we actually create these x-rays? Well, I'm not gonna really, also, here I'm not, I just don't have enough time to really tell you all the details about how these sources work. Um, essentially, this is uh, what you're seeing on the top image here is a picture of the three kilometer long LINEC, um, the linear accelerator that was built at SLAC in the 1960s. Um, and uh, it represents now one of the world's brightest x-ray lasers. So this produces bursts of, of light at x-ray waves wavelengths, um, which can be used to do the type of, of diffraction interference that, that I'm talking about here. So that's pretty much all I'll say about, this, about the sources right now, uh, but we can come back to that. Okay, so what if you apply this? What if you actually had these sources of x-rays and you now try to measure the structure of something? Um, and one of the most beautiful and, and, and famous examples of, of really zooming in at the atomic scale and measuring the structure of something and then learning something important is this example um, of the structure of DNA, which probably many of you know, right, is a, is a double helix. Um, and uh, uh, over here on the, on the far left, uh, this is an example of the original X-ray diffraction pattern that, that Franklin, uh, Watson, and Crick measured in 1953. Uh, and uh, what you're seeing is, is essentially an interference pattern in the end, just like the water wave example that, that I talked about before. And it was from this measurement, from this diffraction pattern, that they were able to work backwards and actually conclude that DNA has this double helix-like structure. Um, and then, of course, once you know it has a double helix, then you start to understand not just the structure, but you start to understand understand something about how the DNA functions, and you start to think about replication and, and all kinds of, of really important aspects in biology. Okay, so in the next slide, I'm going to try to give you a really simple and uh, I think beautiful way of, of understanding the origin of, the, of this diffraction pattern that I show here. The key aspect you can see is this sort of, uh, you'll see, is this X-like like feature that you see in the center of the image. And I'm gonna to try to explain to you in very simple terms what, how this X is related to this helical structure of the DNA. Um, okay, so so to do this, I'm gonna, uh, if we were doing this in person, I would I would actually do the experiment, but 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 um, over Zoom, these experiments won't work that well. So I'm gonna just show you the result of a couple of different experiments that will allow us to build up and and understand the structure of DNA and, and the origin of this X. So um, this first on the top here, this first example is the you know a really simple example of a diffraction pattern. This is what you would measure if you shown a you could do this experiment at home if you have a laser pointer or something like that. Um, uh, if you you shine a laser through a dense array of wires, okay, and you make these wires quite closely spaced to each other, then what you will get is a, essentially a pattern like I show here, um, this sort of a range of spots with bright and dark spots uh, spread out in both directions. And you can kind of already understand the origin of this. If you think about the, the light waves um, uh, passing through this, this set of wires, as you move you know, from one end of the image to the other, as you move left, right, what you're effectively changing is the relative phase of, of the waves scattered from each one of the individual wires. And that's what gives rise in the end to this sort of range of bright and dark spots. It's just constructive and destructive interference. Okay, so that's the sort of diffraction pattern. And the key point to take away from this is in, in particular is that this diffraction pattern is, is set up in a line perpendicular to the, the axis of the wires. And so in particular, if I imagine doing the same experiment, but I rotated my grid of wires by a, by a little bit, then as you might imagine, the diffraction pattern also uh, effectively um, uh, just rotates, okay? Um, and we could even think of now about doing a measurement where we superpose two sets of wire grids, one where the wires are oriented vertically and one where the wires are oriented horizontally. And I think you might, might imagine that in this case, what you would get is something like shown here, right? Where now, instead of just a single set of lines, you measure actually a 2D grid of, of spots. The way to think about this is that, you know, um, the, essentially uh, uh, the, the set of lines on the left give rise to a line. And then for each one of those diffracted lines, those beams can also diffract in the other direction and create a new set of lines. And this defines essentially a, the 2D grid that you're seeing here. Um, and then the final step is we say, well, all right, well, what happens if uh, instead I rotate one of these, these two sets of grids with respect to each other? 
And now I think you could imagine that instead of getting a grid where the angle between the vertical and horizontal lines is 90 degrees, you would create something which looks much more like this X-like structure. Okay, so what's the connection between this and DNA? Well, if you look, if you zoom in on the structure of DNA, here I'm just showing like a zoom in of like a spring or you know, a, a simple helical object. And what you can see here, I've tried to draw the, the lines associated with this. What you can see is that a helix is, is to first order a diffraction grating in the end. And in fact, it's two diffraction gratings. So you have a set of lines going from, from uh, diagonal in one way, and then there's another set of lines going the other way. So in the end, this kind of helical structure really corresponds, is, is exactly like the bottom image. It corresponds to two diffraction patterns, two, two diffraction gratings rotated with respect to each other. And so that's the simple way of, of, of understanding the origin of this X-like like structure. I learned this um, uh, from, from, from the, this, this amazing way of thinking about this from a, from a great YouTube video, uh, Michael Mould, and you, can, uh, you should check that out if you want to learn more about this. Okay, so now you understand how we actually do these structural measurements and how we zoom in and actually can really see the structure of, of materials um, and devices at the atomic scale. So now I want to tell you a little bit about the human brain um, and, um, and how the brain works and, and try to motivate in particular the, the, the real new experiments that we're, that we're about to get to. Okay, so the brain is, is, a, is an amazing, amazing kind of thing. Um, uh, there, uh, your brain, you might know, is made up of, of synapses and neurons. Uh, there's something like 10 to the 15 synapses uh, in, uh, uh, in the human brain, something like 10 to the 11 neurons. These are really unimaginably large numbers. Um, uh, the number of neurons in your brain is, is comparable. This is one way to think about it. It's comparable roughly to the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay. Um, uh, the, the neurons and synapses are connected, you might know, by these sort of long wires. Your brain really is like a, a, a in, in many ways, a, an electrical structure, you know, a, with electrical signals bouncing back and forth uh, through it. And if you took these axons, these axons, these wires that connect one neuron to another, uh, and you connected them all together and uh, lined them up, then amazingly enough, within a single human brain, you would get a, a distance of the order of 10 to the six kilometers, one million meters. Um, so this is roughly the distance from the earth to the moon. And all of this is wrapped up in, inside your head. Um, uh, and then on top of this, we all know that the brain is, is human brain is powerful and, and is capable of achieving amazing things. It's also amazingly energy efficient. Um, and this gets now back to the, some of the early things I started the talk, the talk talking about, uh, these problems that current electronic uh, devices um, uh, run into, current computers based on transistors uh, run into. So the human brain runs on, on just about 10 watts of power. It only weighs a few pounds, um, runs at a, at a frequency of a about 10 hertz. Um, and if you compare this to a supercomputer, a typical supercomputer, these numbers are always going up, but a supercomputer uses a dist, uh, uh, an average power on the order of 10 megawatts. So this is 1 million times the, the, the average power that the human brain works uses. Um, if, you add, if you took all the computers and data centers in the world, uh, uh, it turns out that the total average power added up across the whole globe um, is, is a number of the order of 0.2 terawatts. Okay, or a terawatt is, is 10 to the 12 watts. Uh, and this is roughly, the, the, just, just the computers and data centers in the world use about 10% of the world's electricity. So this, this is an energy problem. It's a, it's a problem that, that impacts things like climate change and, and how we all live. Um, and so it's this type of it's these types of arguments that that motivate um, uh, for us the idea of, of of trying to think about ask to ask the question well can you find material systems that in some way uh, operate the way the brain works okay so um, I have to tell you a little bit more about in particular how neurons um, work and and how they function in order to now to, to then next explain the properties of of, of how uh, of, ha of how we can find materials that, that effectively mimic uh, the, the properties and the functionality of a neuron. So what I'm showing here is sort of a, a zoom in picture of, of sort of a single neuron connected by an axon um, over here. Uh, so uh, uh, at the input of, of the neuron, 
um, what we have is uh, effectively a series of what are called action potentials. These are electrical signals that might be just a few milliseconds or 10 milliseconds in duration. Uh, and these are inputs. These are the inputs that come into a particular neuron. Uh, and the way that this neuron works, one of the key kind of properties, the key functional properties that allows your brain to compute the way it does is based on a, on a, on a property called integrate and fire. So this is roughly what the neuron does. It, it effectively is seeing these pulses come in and it's got a well-defined sort of threshold. Uh, each time a pulse comes in, the, the voltage, the potential uh, within that neuron effectively goes up. And the neuron is kind of designed to say, all right, once this threshold, once this voltage overall reaches a certain overall threshold, once I've gotten a certain number of pulses coming into the neuron, then it says, aha, um, I've, I've gotten 10 pulses or whatever it is, and I will now um, output and, and fire a, um, uh, a signal, uh, uh, which will then communicate to the next neuron down the line. Uh, so these are kind of amazing electrical properties. Uh, the communication from, from one neuron to the other is mediated uh, by, by the synapses, and this involves in turn ionic motion uh, crossing kind of nanometer scale gaps within your brain. Okay, so this, this, uh, the, the sort of key property here is this, is this kind of threshold-like behavior, this idea that, that it can effectively wait and, and acquire a certain number of counts, uh, and then once it's reached a certain threshold, it will fire. So I was trying to think of a, of a good way of explaining this, um, and in the process of, of preparing for this talk, I um, was perusing some parental self-help um, uh, pictures, um, uh, websites, and I found this picture. Um, and so for me, this, this is maybe, at least if you have kids, this is one good way of, of understanding the, this kind of the origin of this kind of integrate and fire. This is a, a parent um, who has been sort of driven to his limit um, and eventually just snaps, right, by his kids. And so in, in many ways, it's this type of, of threshold-like behavior that, that underlies how neurons actually work within your brain. Okay, so a threshold voltage switch. Um, and in many ways, uh, another way of kind of thinking about this is that this is sort of like a, a material with a memory. Right. Um, so, so why do I say that? Well, in some kind of magic way, the neuron is able to kind of count the number of pulses that comes that came in. It's not just looking. It's not just thinking instantaneously about what's coming in. This neuron knows that. Ah, wait. You know, nine other pulses, nine other action potential pulses have already arrived. Now here's the tenth, uh, and I'm going to use this. And now I've crossed my threshold, and I'm going to actually fire. Okay. So. Um, can we find materials? Um, and now we're getting close to the, to the main uh, story of this talk. Um, can we find materials which in some way mimic this behavior? Um, and in fact, we can. And to explain how this works, I have to first tell you a little bit um, about the properties of materials, in particular, the properties of phase transitions in materials. Um, and so this is something that, again, many of you, I think, are, are probably aware of and understand. Um, on the top here um, is this example of, of just a glacier you know, floating somewhere off the coast of Antarctica. Right, and so we all know that that water and ice are really, in some sense, you know, bo both made up of, of H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, and the only difference is, in some sense, is how the atoms, the molecules, are effectively arranged. So in the case of ice, they're arranged in kind of a quasi-periodic array, and they form a, a solid kind of a structure. Whereas in the case of liquid water, uh, once you melt ice, uh, of course, liquid water flows and has a completely different kind of structure. Right, and so the transition from liquid water to ice ice is an example of what we call a phase transition. Um, uh, so on the bottom, I show another kind of uh, cool example. If you're old enough to have seen this movie, um, this is one of the early Superman movies. I think, I think it's maybe the first one uh, from the early 1980s. Uh, and so in this picture, um, what Superman does is he picks up a piece of coal. So coal, you know, is made up of carbon. Um, and he effectively takes it in his hand, squeezes it with all of his strength. And then when he opens it, he's transformed the coal into diamond. So diamond is also made of, of carbon, uh, but it's, it corresponds to a different atomic scale structure. So he drove, and this is an example of what you might call a solid to solid phase transition, where you switch um, one material from one structural phase to another. So it's this property that we're going to essentially take advantage of when we try to um, make this kind of material with a memory. Okay, so here I'm going to give you now one kind of simple example, maybe simple is the wrong word, uh, but one example of, of materials which can effectively mimic this, in particular, this type of integrate and fire functionality. 
Uh, and so these class of materials are called phase change materials. And, and they're called this because they have essentially amazing properties to, to effectively switch between one structural phase and the other. So uh, over here um, on, on one side, I'm showing an example of the crystalline phase of a typical phase change material. All the atoms are arranged in a perfect crystalline lattice. Okay. Now it turns out that by applying electric fields or applying voltage pulses or ap applying light pulses or even temperature, you can effectively switch the material from this crystalline phase to what's called a, an amorphous phase. Uh, and the only difference here now is that the atomic scale structure of this material has been switched. It's been changed to now something where the atoms are kind of arranged in a much more chaotic and, and, and kind of random orientation. Um, so these materials, amazingly enough, can be switched reversibly millions of times uh, back and forth between, between these different structures. And associated with these kind of dramatic changes in the structure uh, are dramatic changes in the electrical conductivity of, of these materials. So you might know that, you know, um, a typical material, um, you know, you might have heard of resistors, uh, you know, that many materials have an effective resistance, which measures a essentially the flow of current in response to a voltage. And, and this is oftentimes characterized and plotted in terms of what's called an IV curve. So on, the, on this plot here, I'm plotting current on the, on the y-axis, um, and on the x-axis, I'm applying a voltage. Um, and so most materials have sort of a linear resistance. If I apply a larger voltage, then more electrons flow. Uh, and typically, if I double the voltage that I apply, then I also double the current. Okay, so that's sort of a, the, the typical response. This is not how phase change materials uh, effectively behave. Uh, so here I'm showing what you measure. This is what the IV curve looks like. This is some real data, some raw data for a particular type of, of phase change material. And you can see it's got a completely different kind of response. Okay, so um, on this plot here, imagine kind of, kind of starting at zero voltage. Okay, in the um, uh, effectively in the amorphous structure of the material, the structure over here where the material is kind of largely non-conducting, it has very low resistance, very high resistance, um, and and very low current flows. So what you can see is as you increase the voltage, as you increase the driving force, essentially initially nothing happens, no currents flowing, uh, but then suddenly you reach this kind of threshold-like behavior, this kind of magic response right around here. Uh, uh, and at this point, something magic happens. A switch happens. The material actually eventually switches into the crystalline phase, um, and it follows kind of a really complex path through this through this space. Um, and then eventually, when you imagine now kind of reducing the current, you can see you go back now on a different line. So this is an example, in many ways, of a material with a memory. Right. I, I've effectively, uh, when I try to apply, um, when I try to apply uh, a voltage and measure the current that's flowing, this material knows whether I've uh, previously applied a voltage which switched it into the, the, the a new phase or not. Okay. So you can already maybe start to see the connections between between this type of of of, of integrated fire behavior and threshold like behavior and the properties of, of phase change materials. Okay. So um, and in fact. Um, and, I, and I won't take you through all the details of this, but other groups uh, around the world have really managed to, to really make real examples of integrated fire functionality. Um, so here is another example of a, of a phase change material embedded uh, between a top and bottom electrode. Um, and what you can see here, what we're plotting is the conductance as a function of the number of pulses that you apply, number of electrical voltage pulses that we apply to the switch. So each time we apply a voltage, atoms move around in some complex pattern, uh, but overall the conductance does initially doesn't change like I was showing on the previous slide. But then right around some sort of magic number of pulses of the order of 10 or nine or something like that, you can see this dramatic switching occurs. Uh, the conductance shoots up uh, and this corresponds to now a structural change within the material uh, and the material is effectively switching from one structural phase um, to another. So you can really see now, this is sort of a direct example of the integrated fire kind of threshold-like behavior that, um, that um, occurs in these materials. Uh, and people have thought of, of many even more complex ways of, of kind of doing this. Um, here's one more example of kind of an array where you imagine at each, this is sort of a, what's called a crossbar geometry, at each one of these kind of crossing points, at each one of these nodes is a small nanoscale bit of material. Um, and we can individually address each one of these nodes, apply an electric field. When we do this, we effectively cause atoms to flow from one electrical gap across a 
a small nanometer scale gap to the other. And we can effectively modulate at each point, in the, at every crossing point in here, the conductivity, the resistance of, of, of the structure. Um, and so essentially we, we can actually effectively do this now um, and uh, use these types of approaches to, to actually do a whole range of, of kind of important processes, information uh, important for image recognition and, and information processing, matrix multiplication uh, and things like that. But the crazy thing is, the amazing thing about all of this is that no one's ever been able to really directly probe these switching processes before. Uh, and this is what really motivates us to apply the type of techniques that, are, that we're talking about, uh, to go beyond this kind of, of, of uh, you know, working in the dark, working blind, uh, and really start to see the structures that were the complex structures that we're dealing with uh, and use this to, to, um, to um, understand something deep about how these materials actually work. So uh, in the end now, I've, I think I've, I've gotten to the main part of the talk now. Uh, we can now do exactly the type of, of imaging that I showed, um, you know, these original Edgerton movies, uh, but now we can use diffraction to really see at the atomic scale what atoms are doing. And we can actually, in many cases, we can, oftentimes we, we can apply some kind of trigger Okay, so in this in this sort of cartoon schematic here, we're applying light pulses. These light pulses are kind of initiating a reaction, starting some process, uh, and then we can kind of take a snapshot with a short pulse of X-rays or a short pulse of electrons, measure the diffraction pattern. Uh, this creates this kind of you know pattern of bright and dark spots on the screen, uh, and from these we can work backwards and actually learn something about the structure, and now watch the structure as it evolves as a function of time. Okay, so I'm going to give you kind of for now now two very quick examples of of, of some some experiments um, along these lines, uh, and then I want to zoom in uh, for the final sort of five minutes of the talk uh, and talk about the the most recent results where we're really applying these type of approaches to really watch a device as it functions uh, under pulsed electric fields and and so on. Okay, so here's an example of, of an experiment looking at exactly the type of, of phase change materials that I, that I was talking about just about five minutes ago. These materials that can be reversibly switched between a crystalline and an amorphous structure. So um, way over here on the, on, on the far left, I'm showing the diffraction pattern measured uh, from one of these structures. Uh, and it's initially, it's in this amorphous disordered structure. Uh, and you can see if you look at this kind of diffraction pattern, it's got this very broad and diffuse features. And this is reflective of the fact that the atoms within the structure are really roughly randomly arranged, not perfectly randomly, uh, but, but quite randomly arranged. Um, and the result is that you don't get very nice, well-defined interference patterns. You don't get lots of well-defined bright spots. It's much more of a diffuse-like structure. Okay, so now what I'm showing here, um, uh, just next to this, is the same, the same material, but now the only thing we've done is we fired a single optical pulse of this material, and we've effectively switched it from the amorphous phase into the crystalline phase. And now you can see that instead of having this kind of broad, diffuse-like structures, it's got now much more sharp, well-defined peaks. Uh, and this is reflective now of the fact that we formed little kind of crystallites of this material, where the atoms are arranged in this perfect periodic lattice. So this is sort of before and after images, but we can actually kind of put this together and make a kind of a real movie here. And so now on this plot here, I'm plotting the dynamics of how the diffraction pattern is changing across about seven orders of magnitude in time. So we start down here, right around time zero, right around kind of zero, uh, uh, a couple of picoseconds. Um, uh, on the x-axis here is basically a, the, the, the it's, it, what I'm really plotting is like the radial coordinate of, the, of these diffraction images over here. So you can see at the bottom here, we've got this very broad diffuse-like structure reflective of the fact that we have this disordered overall structure. Uh, and then as a function of time, as you move up on this plot, you can see the diffraction pattern is evolving following the application of a single laser pulse. Uh, so uh, initially you form some different uh, type of structure. This is actually an intermediate phase of the material that's never been observed before. Uh, uh, and then on even longer time scales, you can see there's now some sort of magic threshold-like response where the material at a, at a time scale of the order of hundreds of nanoseconds or a microsecond uh, effectively suddenly switches into the crystalline phase. And that's, and that's captured by by the emergence of these now very well-defined narrow diffraction peaks reflective of the, of the crystalline structure. Okay, so, um, so that's just one simple example. There's a lot more I could say about that, um, uh, but, but the first order, 
uh, the, the takeaway is that we can apply these types of experiments to really watch these transitions as they happen. We can start to learn something about the pathways materials follow as they uh, switch between one structural phase and the other. And already you can start to see examples here where, again, just like when you zoom in on the on the you know, someone dropping something into a, gla a glass of milk, you start to see these amazing complex structures um, start to emerge. Um, here's one other kind of interesting and, and pretty, inter pretty interesting and pretty cool um, example taken from the field of what, of what are oftentimes called two-dimensional materials. Okay, and so, so this sounds complicated, uh, but, but in fact, we're all familiar with, with these types of materials. If you've ever used a pencil, pencils are made of graphite. And, and if you zoom in on the structure of graphite, graphite, it turns out, um, is effectively what's called a layered structure. It's made up of many atomically thin layers of carbon, one stacked on top of the other on top on top of the other. Uh, and the layers themselves are very, very weakly bonded with respect to each other. Uh, and it's this process that you're taking advantage of whenever you write with a pencil. As you scratch the pencil across the page, what you're doing is kind of shearing off um, one layer or a few layers of, of this, um, uh, of, the, of the graphite um, uh, and transferring it from the pencil to the paper. Uh, and so this, this interaction force, this force that holds one atomic layer to the other uh, is, is, is an important force. It's called the van der Waals force. In fact, it's the same force that, that geckos take advantage of and when they hang upside down from, from flat surfaces. Uh, and this, this idea that you can effectively take advantage of these types of weak interactions um, has really um, represented a, really a new direction in the field. You can imagine now, that's what's shown over here on the far left, you can imagine stacking materials Material, one material on top of another and synthesizing new types of structures. Um, you can imagine controlling the relative twist of, of these materials or sliding one mate material with respect to the other um, and so on. Um, and so we, in some, in some recent experiments, we tried to take advantage of this. And again, I'm only gonna sort of scratch the surface of this, but we essentially measured the, the first of all, the diffraction pattern of, a, of an important class of, the, of these two dimensional materials. Uh, and then what we did was we fired light pulses at it. Um, and we found by measuring, essentially watching the twinkling of these stars, that the intensities of, the, of these spots, as I've explained to you, encodes the atomic scale structure. We were able to see that what we were actually doing was kind of creating what's what we called it an interlayer shear. It's kind of uh, shown here in, uh, schematically in this picture right here, where one atomic layer maybe slides to the left, another slides to the right, the next one slides to the right. And this whole process is actually oscillating back and forth on amazingly fast timescales, on picosecond timescales. Uh, this process, if you live in California, you should know about shear. Um, uh, in, in, you, know, you might know that, that in earthquakes, uh, earthquakes are oftentimes divided into longitudinal waves. These are or compressional waves that, that kind of compress objects as they propagate, and then also shear waves um, in, in, in which uh, the, the, the structure is kind of sliding transversely to the side as the wave effectively propagates. So in these experiments, what we were able to do was effectively modulate the structure dramatically of, of these different materials, and in fact, form a kind of what we call the topological switch. Um, and I won't tell you too much about, about the origin of, or what, what this word topological means, but, but this would be, again, a good good place for questions if you're interested in this. Uh, and we've taken this even further. We've actually taken the same type of material and we've now integrated it into real devices and, and applied electrical uh, voltage uh, voltages to these systems. And it turns out that, that again, by applying voltages to these systems, you can kind of control at the atomic scale how one layer slides with respect to the other. And in fact, you can take advantage of this um, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, find new ways of encoding new types of information um, in these materials. Again, related to the topological properties uh, of, of these materials. Uh, so the key takeaway from, from all of this, just to, to try to connect to what I've already talked about, these are examples of, of really ultra fast types of, of, of motions, um, atomic scale kind of distortions of one layer with respect to the other. Uh, and just from the fact that you're only sliding these layers very small distances, uh, effectively you need very low energies to actually drive this process, and you also can can effectively uh, drive this process on very fast timescales. So this, these aspects of energy and time, effectively, uh, you kind of win, win twice when working in, in these types of geometries, right? You win in terms of speed and you win in terms of energy cost by, take, by finding materials where you have very weak interactions uh, connecting one atomic layer to the next. 
Okay, so now um, uh, in the very last part of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about the, the most recent experiments that we did where we really now approach this limit of really trying to look at, at, at a real electronically driven device uh, and material, which really does mimic the way the human brain actually works, the way, the way neurons actually work. Um, it really exhibits this type of threshold-like behavior. And I'm gonna show you how we can use these types of experiments to really learn some new things about, about how these devices actually work. Um, so here's a kind of a very rough schematic of, of, of the experiments and, and how these experiments actually work. Um, in this case, we're actually not using x-rays uh, to do the diffraction. We're actually using pulses of electrons. It turns out electrons also have a wavelength. Um, uh, and um, we're using these kind of very, very short um, wavelength electrons compressed into a narrow bunch to effectively take snapshots of the structure. Um, so here you can see this, this, this little sort of white in this picture this white sort of uh, pulse of electrons is traveling from left to right on your screen and heading toward this electronic device. Uh, uh, this device we're applying electrical bias pulses to. Uh, we have top electrode structures on this thing. And what we're going to do is we're going to essentially switch this material from one structural phase to another. And then again, try to watch as this, as this process actually happens. So here's the electron getting a little bit closer uh, to, uh, to the switch. Um, and then it passes through and we measure the diffraction pattern on the back screen. Uh, and then we apply all the principles that we just talked about to do the synchronized electron photography. Um, so um, the, 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 the um, key thing here, the key idea here is we can uh, effectively apply this voltage pulse, the switch, we can change the structure of the material. And the question is, how does this material actually switch from one phase to another? Um, can we find new ways of encoding information in this? Can we find new ways of, of doing this with low energy, uh, minimizing the energy costs for switching and so on? Um, so the material that we were looking at is, is a really amazing material. And again, I won't, I won't really tell you too much about it right now, but it's a material called vanadium dioxide. Uh, uh, and this material really does, uh, in this kind of simple form uh, shown on the top here, where you have essentially just sort of a bit, a small region of, of, of vanadium dioxide sitting between a top and bottom electrode, this really does, um, in many ways, mimic the properties of, of of, uh, of neurons in your brain. You can actually, uh, within circuits like this, create the analog of action potentials. But now where the pulses here, the effective pulses are much, much shorter than the, than the, than the action potentials um, in your brain. Uh, you can, in fact, by applying voltages above a certain threshold, uh, you can make this material really act like it has a memory. Uh, and in fact, you can switch it um, from uh, an insulating phase. That's what I'm showing, showing on, the, on the very far left over here, uh, the sort of glass, the Stanford glass, which is, which is transparent and, and insulating and doesn't conduct electricity. And just by applying a, a single pulse of, of electricity, you can switch it into a metallic phase, which effectively conducts electricity. And the dynamics of this process has been something that's been debated and, and um, uh, it's something that been, people have been interested in for, for many, many uh, decades now, I would say. Uh, there are lots of other kind of cool applications of this material. Uh, you can think about making, for example, things like smart windows, right? So imagine that, you know, in an office building, uh, if you could just apply a, uh, an electrical signal and effectively control the transparency of a window, you could really have, a, this could have a big impact on the overall energy costs that the, that the building uses, right? If on a very hot day, if you can dim the window and effectively make the, the glass less transparent, uh, uh, and then on very cold days, you can uh, make the window fully transparent and absorb all the energy from the sun, then this can have really big effects on, on the overall energy budget of, 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 of buildings. Uh, so all of these properties are kind of encoded um, in this kind of uh, magic material, VO2. Okay, so um, so in this um, in these type of materials, I already showed you one on the top. This is this is the example of the phase change materials. One example of a material with memory. Uh, on the bottom here, I'm showing um, really our measurements of of these of these types of devices. And you can see, just to cut a long story short, you can see first of all way over here. On the, on the far side, uh, if I measure the IV curve, if I apply voltages and measure currents, uh, then in fact, the, the, uh, this material really does have this really complex like behavior. It has a threshold switch associated with it. Uh, the material can be switched into a new structural phase. It really acts like a material with a memory. Uh, and in fact, we can drive these type of switching processes um, over and over and again, millions and millions of times. Okay. 
Um, so in the actual experiments, we were interested in trying to measure both the structure of these materials, how the atoms were actually arranged, moving, uh, but then also simultaneously find ways of measuring how electrical current um, and the dynamics of, of how electrical current is also moving through the material, capturing both the structure, what the atoms are doing, and then also simultaneously what the electrical, how the electrical properties of this material were actually changing as well. Uh, and so all of this was kind of integrated into this kind of fairly complex uh, device structure where we had electrodes, uh, we had bunches of electrons coming in um, uh, and we were able to apply fast rising voltage pulses uh, in order to make these measurements of, of the structure and the electrical properties. Um, and again, there's probably much, much too much for me to, to really say about this right now, uh, but I wanna just sort of just spend one minute and just walk you through some of the data that, that we see from this. So in, in these plots here, what I'm showing is um, in, the, in this kind of purple curve here, this is a plot of the electrical properties of the material, the resistance of the material. Uh, so what we're doing is we're applying a voltage pulse right around time zero. Okay, and you can see there's a couple of just really surprising and interesting things that happen. First of all, we apply this voltage pulse um, right around here, but you can see that after the voltage pulse is applied, the resistance kind of doesn't change for a while, right? It just stays constant. And then suddenly it switches after some time delay. So this kind of time delay, this period where the material has already been kind of triggered, it's been pushed, but hasn't actually switched is called the incubation phase um, of the material. And so for the first time, we can actually interrogate and measure the structure of these materials during this incubation phase, for example. Uh, and we can start to ask questions like, what is the, the pathway that these materials actually follow as they transform? Uh, and to, to cut a long story short, uh, the sort of key takeaway from these experiments is that we really can, first of all, watch the transition from this insulating phase to this conducting phase, but we also see evidence for a different structure, a structure not previously seen before uh, under this type of, of, of excitation condition, this electrically driven condition. Uh, and in particular, this intermediate structure is also conducting, but it involves a much, much more subtle structural distortion. So what we can imagine now is that just by taking advantage of this kind of threshold switch, we found a way to effectively modulate the electrical properties of the material while driving much smaller displacements of the atoms. Uh, and this in turn, we, we think, and we don't know the answer to this yet, uh, but we think should, should really give rise to much, much lower energy costs for, for effectively the, the driving this switching. Um, so in the end, what we, the, the key takeaway here is the observation of this, of this kind of intermediate phase. And, and more broadly, this opens up new possibilities for, for creating new types of materials. You can apply voltages and really take advantage of, the, of, this types of these types of dynamics to create new kind of properties of new materials with interesting uh, functional properties. Uh, all right. So, um, um, so as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, um, I really feel like like we're we're at the very we don't really only scratch the surface of this work and and certainly there are many more um, questions remaining than answers. Um, for me, I kind of feel like like you're on a you're climbing a mountain uh, and you cro you kind of turn the corner and suddenly in front of you is this amazing kind of valley of mountains and glaciers and and rocks and and um, and you see this vast expanse and and for me this is kind of the uh, where I where I think we are. Um, at this point here in, in the field where we've kind of really done some very first preliminary experiments, uh, but we have this kind of really broad range of possibilities uh, that we can apply these approaches to, 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 to really um, push this field into new, into new directions. Uh, so um, I want to just um, end the talk by just very briefly um, thanking um, some, some very important people, um, in particular the, the key people that really kind of led this work. Um, and two of them are actually here with us as panelists, and I'll introduce them formally in just a second. Um, uh, one uh, is Aditya Sood. He's the one who led the work on vanadium dioxide. Um, and Jun Shao um, here um, is, uh, uh, is the person who led the work on, on the two-dimensional materials. And then additionally, Edward C., who also was closely involved in, the, in this 2D materials work. Um, and many other people um, contributed really closely and strongly to this work. It wouldn't have been possible without uh, this type of collaborative effort that, that makes um, science really fun. Um, so with that, I think I will thank you for your attention and I will turn things back over to Michael temporarily before we start the question and answer session, which I'm very much looking forward to. Michael, are you there? Uh, yes, so 
Uh, look, thank you very much. There's a lot of very cool stuff in this, in this lecture. And now we'll talk about it in a little more depth. Um, let me just tell the audience, we'll have about 20 minutes of question and answer. <clears throat> and then at the end of it, um, there's a survey that our team would like you to answer. So uh, if you would please take just a couple minutes after the end of the Q&A to fill that out, we'd really appreciate it. So Aaron, why don't you go ahead and introduce the panelists? Yeah, okay. So we have two, um, uh, two important panelists here. These are two guys who I have, have really utmost respect for as scientists. Um, Aditya Sood is, is currently a postdoc and a staff scientist um, here at Slack. Um, who I've worked closely with, and and um, and and he really led this work on on this electrically driven transition in, in vanadium dioxide. Um, uh, and then Jun Xiao, um, he was formerly he was a postdoc um, working with me um, uh, until recently. He's just started a, an assistant professorship at the University of Wisconsin, um, and and he's the person who who you know has really been thinking about the the two D materials and things like that. Um, so they're both here to um, help and answer any questions that you might have. Okay, well, um, I encourage everybody to open up the Q&A box and type in your questions, but a number of people have done that already. So, um, ah, there we go, that's me. Um, a number of people have done that already, so let me start with those questions. So, first of all, it, at the end of the talk, you described this very cool um, piece of equipment with two pieces of metal and this VO2 like synapse like thing, which is between them. So how big is that? And I know it's quite small. So how do you actually make that thing? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, that, so in the experiments that we've done so far, these are kind of micron scale. Um, uh, and, um, and, but we're, we're definitely interested in, in pushing to much, much smaller lane scales as well. Uh, maybe actually Aditya, you should say something about how you actually made these devices since you were the one who actually did it. Sure. Um, yeah, that's a really good question and something that we took a long time to figure out. Um, so the key challenge with these experiments is that you want to make this magic material, which is vanadium dioxide or whatever you're using to compute. Uh, really, really thin because you want to be able to send electrons through it. Um, so the thickness of these devices is about 100 nanometers or tens of nanometers. So that's really, um, it's a challenge. And so you have to make these devices in a way that they're actually suspended in vacuum. Um, and then you also have to find a way to um, actually engineer and put down metallic electrodes on top of them and put all of this inside this vacuum chamber, which is shooting electrons through this, um, this magic material. Um, so so yeah, that was, uh, so we used kind of standard uh, lithography techniques, very similar to what is used by uh, companies like Intel and so on to make uh, sort of semiconductor um, transistors. Um, and yeah, so it, it's a bunch of optical aligning and, and, and things like that. Um, but I think the key thing is, is making these devices and then also integrating the timing of firing these devices electrically with the electron pulses, uh, which are sort of shooting like bullets through these devices. So that's, I think, uh, another sort of key aspect of this experiment is the synchronization. Yeah, I might, I might also add one of the other kind of important directions we're working on is, is trying to push the time resolution of these measurements. So you can imagine really trying to make the, the transition time, the, the, the time in which this electrical pulse effectively turns on shorter and shorter and really start to learn something about the sort of ultimate speed limits for, for that, that underlie how these devices operate. Interesting. Actually, someone else asked about that. What is the ultimate uh, speed limit? for a device, well, first of all, for the device, and then secondly, for your ability to measure it? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. Um, well, so in the experiments that we've really done so far, um, we've, uh, as, I, as I showed in, the, in those plots, we were really looking in, in those final set of experiments on kind of switching time scales just on the order of microseconds. So it's still pretty fast, but it's not that fast. Uh, but it turns out that, that we, um, through these experiments, and in particular by kind of comparing the response that we see under electrical biases with the response under optical pulses. We learned something actually very important that lets us actually maybe at least start to speculate about what those ultimate speed limits are. And it may be that there are really possibilities of, of pushing this to much, much shorter timescales on the order of picoseconds uh, mm -hmm. rather than the timescales that we've actually measured. But we haven't demonstrated that um, so far. 
So with luck, a trillionth of a second. So possibly. Um, so these systems often have memory, and you you talked about that. But this is something different from computer memory. This is a different kind of memory. Could you just amplify that a little? Yeah, um, yeah. This is a good question. Uh, yeah, there's lots of, of of different ways of of storing information in in materials. You know, um, you know, within within your computer, there there you know people you can store information in the magnetic properties of materials. For example, um, there are many ways of, of of storing this type of information. Here, this is this is a little bit different in that, like you know, um, effectively we're encoding information in the the structure of of the arrangement of of atoms in the end, um, and in the end there. Are are kind of energy barriers. There are kind of processes that that once you've effectively switched this material, um, effectively um, stabilize this material in this structure. So you can depend upon, you know, once you've actually switched it, um, you can depend upon it actually, um, you know, really staying in that phase until you maybe you want to switch it back. Uh, but this is a really important kind of direction. I don't know if, I, if you, uh, June or Aditya, you guys want to comment on on that question. Yeah, maybe I can add a few sure. uh, few words on that. Yeah, yeah. As Aaron said, like in the in the current like uh, computers, we have like uh, different type of memories. Uh, like in the CPU, we have the primary memory. So the uh, most likely, uh, most of them are actually the volatile ones, like the DRAM, SRAM. So they can operate super fast. But however, if you don't have the power supply, they will lose their state. And we also have much slower one, like the hard disk, the magnetic disk, and also the SSD, the solid state drive, those based on the floating uh, gates uh, to provide some non-volatile like support there. So I think the uh, what we are studying based on the phase change memory or like for electric ones, like based on the 2D materials, they have the potential to both reach to the ultra fast operation speed, as well as have the non-volatile energy efficiency, like to reduce the energy cost. So that's why I think our work is kind of kind of unique, and not only us, and also a lot of people working on this emerging field, like try to push. Okay, we can have ultra fast speed as well as a, a, a ultra high energy efficiency in the same system. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, an important thing that we don't still don't know how to do is is really measure in some sense in a direct sense. You know, we, we'd like to find ways of, of kind of measuring the energy costs associated with these switching processes in, in clear, well-defined ways. We have we've we've been able to estimate this kind of roughly, but but this is definitely something for the future as well. Mm. But but you know that it's small, or how can you compare it to something, even with the estimate? We, we've done for, for the for the two D material work. I think we can we can estimate this pretty well, um, and we can actually compare it to other types of phase change memory, other types of, of flash memory, and so on. And and it seems like 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 this this new type of of memory where we encode information in the sliding of of atomic layers really should be much much more energy efficient. Now I should also really say it uh, importantly. You know we're we're I think very far from from actually applying this and using this in, in, in a real computer. Mm -hmm. We're really at the, at the fundamental stage right now. Um, but but it, it looks promising, yeah. Okay. Um, one of the audience members, I, I guess you build these devices like one switch at a time, but one of the audience members was wondering whether you eventually will be able to make large arrays or even 3D arrays of these materials? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. Aditya, do you want to comment on that? Um, I think the answer is yes, we'd love to do that. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I think for an actual computing application, you definitely will have these large two-dimensional arrays which act as sort of cross points in a, in a matrix um, and then potentially three dimensions as well. Um, I, I should say, I think for phase change memory, I might be wrong, but I think there's, there's definitely commercial um, sort of implementations of phase change memory, I think, and there's possibly some which is going towards three dimensions. Um, but for our experiments, I think we were trying to understand what happens at the single switch level. But the dream is to have this entire sort of matrix operating by itself with voltage pulses and current pulses, and we would just come in and sort of look at what the atoms are doing in all of these devices at the same time, or maybe in, in quick succession. So that, yeah. would be, that would be super awesome. 
yeah, we've we've kind of the measurements that I described are you know looking sort of at like you know a single neuron in some sense, thinking about the the analogy to the brain. But of course, you know, a, as we said, we'd like to connect these things and start to think about how these things interact and and so on. Okay. Um, you compared the times and energies to materials, but Bernard would like to know, how does the size, energy usage, and switching time compare to neurons? Are, are you getting to that level yet, or are you past it even? Yeah, well, in the material examples that I talked about, we're switching on much, much faster time scales than, than, than the, 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 the way. So neurons, you know, the brain works at, I mentioned, roughly you know, 10 hertz, um, and the action potentials have widths of the order of, of several milliseconds. Um, whereas some of the examples I mentioned, like in this 2D material example where we drive the switch, this is happening many, many orders of magnitude faster on, on picosecond time scales. Uh, yes, but we still have to learn how to use it as well as the brain uses it. Mm -hmm. That's right. We are very yeah, far yeah. from that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think the integration probably will be the next big directions, like uh, to integrate single devices and to scale up as much as possible, like to have more neurons inside. Yeah. Yeah, artificial neurons inside. Yeah. Like as Aaron mentioned in the beginning, or in the introduction slides, like in our human brain, so that's have 10 to 11, like about 10 billion neurons. Uh, so right now, I think even including those CMOS type of neurons, the, the record is only like uh, less than 1 million artificial neurons we can integrate in one chip. So definitely there are still a much larger gap there. But fortunately, we have ultra fast speed, like uh, operation for those like semiconductor devices. So that's why like still we have a great way over the uh, our human brain, yeah, in some sense, yeah. Yeah, there's this amazing sort of, of connection mm -hmm. between the speed that these devices operate at and the energy mm -hmm. costs, um, and, and they really work together in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. There are some properties of the materials that are very special. Um, and Jim would like to know, uh, you, how do you choose these materials? And is it just by accident that you encounter materials with these special properties or do you kind of engineer them? Yeah, this is a, this is a great question. Um, I mean, I, my sense is that, yeah, you know, today, like if you look at the materials that, that are being used for this type of, of approaches, they really, you know, um, a lot of them were kind of stumbled upon. Um, uh, and, you know, there really isn't a, right now a really, uh, well-defined way of, of, you know, um, uh, effectively, you know, before you actually do an experiment, really concluding that this material will be really be optimum. But this is something that, that, that there are lots of ongoing efforts. It's a really challenging computational problem just because, you know, essentially solving the equations that describe the, the, the structural and electronic properties of these materials are, are amazing, is amazing, amazingly complex kind of process. Um, but um, there, there are many theoretical groups around the world working on, on trying to get at exactly this problem. We think also that some of these approaches will, that, that I described will, will help in, 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 this, in this endeavor. It allows for kind of screening new types of materials um, and starting to understand and, and map out the phase space of, of what's, you know, of kind of what, which materials have which type of useful functionality. Actually, that's a very interesting statement. So you say that these materials are no longer being discovered by people being lucky in the laboratory. People are actually going after them specifically. It, it's the early stages of this, I would say. I mean, um, yeah, it, it's still, I would say, mostly discovery or, or kind of, you know, building upon what, what you people already know, you know, there are many connections between different material classes. And so sometimes you can say, well, you know, we see this in this particular, like in the example of the phase change materials that I talked about, um, there are many, many types of, these are oftentimes alloys um, and you can mix together ver various types of elements together. Um, and there's a whole kind of large family of these things. And with different concentrations, you oftentimes can tweak and, and kind of optimize the, the properties, the switching speed, the energy costs. Um, of these materials, uh, but there, it's a giant face space of, of possibilities. Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, Meryl would like to know, what does the topological switch have to do with topology? 
<laughs> okay. There's some other crazy language there that I don't even understand. So maybe yeah, well, um, we might we might need to spend another hour or something um, um, uh, talking about this. But but I can try to do do this in in thirty seconds. Um, so so basically, the the um, the topological properties of materials. Um, uh, this is what we're talking about here. Are kind of the kind of the the um, the what what's called the wave function. The, the kind of pro the distributions of electrons um, in these materials. And it turns out that in very abstract ways, the, these types of structures are, are in some way mathematically equivalent to shapes that you can picture in your mind, like, like a sphere or a donut or, or something like that. Um, and they're sort of amazing mappings between the mathematics of, of understanding shapes and how they deform and the properties of, of materials. And you can actually take advantage of this in interesting ways. So you can actually, if you can find certain materials which exhibit these type of topological properties, sometimes you can find properties which are in some ways more robust um, and, and, you know, more, uh, more stable to external perturbations. Uh, I don't know, June, you want to take a shot at that as well? Yeah, topology is not that easy to explain. Yeah, I think you already did a good job there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you know, in our case, I think like uh, like topology, as I mentioned, like we are talking about the uh, the band structure. So, like uh, in mathematics, it's talking about the shape of the your of your subjects, like donuts and board. They belong to different topology. And in our systems, we are talking about the band structure, how the electron uh, they distribute their energy and the momentum uh, in a specific crystal. Uh, like we can classify their band structure into different topology. And uh, for topological materials, that's belong to a specific topology, and they will have uh, like uh, uh, like uh, some unique edge states uh, with ballistic transport uh, uh, properties there. So that's very appealing for electronic applications since you don't have any scattering, you don't have like dual heating. So once we can utilize those like like to uh, topological edge states uh, to do electronic or opto uh, opto electronic applications, this will save a lot of energy cost. So that's a, a primary motivation for our study. And in specific Edward's work, uh, we try to like uh, enable the switching between topological states and non-topological states, like to drive this type of topological switch in the uh, 2D materials and uh, using optical way. I think that's a main subject uh, what he studied before, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, Pierre asked about the term topological insulator. So I think you made a reference to that in this answer. That this is another kind of material that's closely related to some of the ones that you're working with. Yeah, like, so in particular, the material that that we that I was discussing, it's actually not a topological insulator. It's some. It's actually something related to it. It's actually a topological, what's called a semi-metal. Um, so it actually has more metallic properties than than insulating properties. It turns out, um, and there's kind of magic things that happen right at the points where the conduction band and the valence band actually meet. Okay. The, the band, I guess the audience should know, is the way the electron energy levels lay out across. The yeah. Board. Yeah. Okay. Um, Merrill would, uh, sorry, Leon would like to know what the timeline is for going from these things, very idealized things you're talking about to a practical device. I mean, you don't have to model today's computers. I, I, I remember when the uh, HP calculator came in one could do calculations on a thing you could hold in your hand. How long until we could get the HP calculator with this technology? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard question. I mean, without question, we, we have not left transistors in the dust um, today, <laughs> right? Um, that's for sure. We, you know, we're really at the very early stages um, of, of these efforts. You know, the, the work that I described is really quite fundamental and we're really at the stage where we're just trying to understand how these devices function. So I don't know, I don't have a really good guess at all. I wouldn't even probably, especially since this talk is gonna be on YouTube, um, uh, I probably should play it safe, but I don't know if you guys wanted to make a guess. Um, yeah, I was, I was definitely not going to make a guess on the timeline, but I was just gonna say that, you know, um, it's not, I mean, it, it may be the case that these kinds of uh, devices don't replace silicon transistors, but they complement it in the sense that, you know, these kinds of technologies which operate like the brain are really good for energy efficient and data intensive computing. So these could be important for things like, you know, um, self-driving cars where you have huge bucket loads of data coming in and you don't really care about storing them for a long time. You just want to compute them on the fly. 
Um, so, so these kinds of devices could be powerful to do those kinds of tasks, but maybe not replace um, silicon in like our, our PCs anytime soon. Mm. Okay, let me ask you uh, just one more question, but maybe this will take you a little while. Um, there's also, these are quantum devices, but there's also something called quantum computing. Is there a relation between these devices and that or um, relation between other things that you do that are related to this and the possibility of really using quantum mechanics for computing? Yeah, um, so this is again, a, a good question. Um, th there definitely are, are important connections. I mean, I could, I could point to, so you know, um, as, as you mentioned, there's, there's a lot of efforts around the world you know, trying to find, again, new ways of, of doing computing um, where, where you take advantage of, of again, the, the quantum mechanical properties of materials to, to effectively do um, much, much more efficient computing in the end. Um, uh, certainly, there are, there are connections to some of the topological aspects that, that we mentioned. Um, so, you know, one of the key challenges in terms of, again, quantum computing is at the very early stages, right? And, and you could ask similar questions about when it's really going to be going to be useful. But one of the key challenges in quantum computing is, is effectively finding ways of, of encoding the information in the quantum mechanical properties of the material and then having it actually remain there. Um, and and uh, it's a sort of a wave-like phenomena, just like I was talking about with respect to interference and things like that. The problem is many of these systems interact with their environment and, and this information is, is lost um, and the wave-like properties are effectively lost. Um, so if you can find ways of, of of storing that information in more robust ways. And these types of, of topological aspects is one approach that people have proposed for, for doing this, then you might find one way ar around those types of, those types of roadblocks. Um, uh, yeah, that's at least one comment I could make on this. Maybe I should um, see if, if June wants to make another, any other comments on that. Yeah, sure, sure. I can add a few uh, yeah. sentences here. So uh, in the beginning, I mean, this two actually is kind of distinct, the branches like uh, both of them like have the potential to improve the computing efficiency or have bring revolution like computing technology uh, compared with uh, current like uh, computer uh, technology here. Uh, like for neuromorphic, it's more in the beginning, it's more like uh, focus on its architecture level, like how we uh, convert the original like CPU, like connect to the uh, memory like serial in a serial channel instead of using, uh, rather than use them. I mean, instead we use like kind of a bio inspired or we have neuron, artificial neuron, artificial synopus, and we have multiple hyper connectivities between each computing units. I think that's uh, original. Uh, like when people are talking about neuromorphic stuff, like uh, that's uh, more focused on the architecture. Maybe the single device level is still transistor, and uh, of course, certainly uh, for what Aaron present today is like, also we try to like alter the single label or single unit uh, device, rather than use just the uh, like CMOS transistors. We want to use some new materials, phase change or 2D materials, which can bring more like uh, energy efficiency here based on their non-volatile transition behaviors. Uh, but for quantum computing, I mean, that's uh, totally different because it harvests the uh, quantum mechanic like concepts in some specific uh, qubits, like their superposition states. So they are not well defined zero and one. They are not binary uh, deterministically. Uh, in neuromorphic, uh, we can like, we are still like rely on the uh, deterministic states like VO2, we have the metal state, we have the insulating state. But uh, indeed, I think that's a very exciting direction if somehow we can combine these two since <laughs> more and more like people try to use quantum materials to as a uh, unit for the neuromorphic computing. So that's a merging point. Or well, another direction is that whether we can harvest the neuromorphic architecture into the quantum computing. So essentially we still have our qubits, but how they connect each other, whether we can use the neuromorphic like architecture concepts to connect each other. So I think that those are also very good or exciting directions to further boost the, the computing, computing efficiency. Yeah. Another comment I could add to that would be, 
um, very broadly the, the, the experimental approaches I described for where we can actually you know, really watch these devices as they function. These are, could be quite interestingly, and we're already working on this in, in some respects, applied to some of the, the materials that people have proposed for quantum computing, uh, where you could now imagine you know, encoding information in some local defect in a solid and trying to understand the kind of microscopic properties that underlie the, what's called the, the loss of decoherence, the, essentially the loss of, of the wave-like properties of the materials. You can sort of watch this qubit as it couples to its environment and, and watch these processes. And again, these are kind of intrinsically dynamic processes. Interesting. Maybe you need different kinds of materials to solve different problems neuromorphically? Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay, is anybody working on that or that's uh, for the future? Someone out in the audience who's in high school now can take up that problem. Yeah, there's certainly a, an amazing range of, of possibilities. This field is, is you know, it, it, people have been thinking about these ideas for quite some time, but I really feel like, like it's, it's um, at a point where there's, you know, it, it really has more of a firm footing and, and there's lots of new, of new directions to go, I think. Okay, well, look, thank you very much. I think we're out of time. Um, for those of you in the audience, please stay around for just a moment. There'll be a, a poll which is flashed in front of you. But let's thank uh, Aaron and also Aditya and Jun for a very stimulating lecture. Thanks yes, for all thank the great you. questions. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Michael.